I mean, the first part of the presentation, I'll go into more detail, but I've been working alongside Alex for three years now. Um, but prior to that was just a mushroom farmer and things have snowballed since then. And I've been diving into so many different mycological niches and finally beginning to focus. So yeah, I now for Mushroom Revival, I just do the podcast. I work full time for another biotech company now, but it's great. And we'll tell you so much more about that. Yeah, yeah so I guess our, our whole our whole presentation is kind about, of is kind of our intro, bio, yeah. so <laughs> we'll just jump into it. Give anything away. We, we get your life story of the last three years or last five yeah. years. Yeah. Okay. Thumbs up. You can see it. Yep. Yep. Cool. Awesome. It's not full screen yet, but yeah, we'll get there. I Talk thought later. we would. Awesome. Oh, this was. I, I recognize I, them. Yeah. <laughs> when do you, Alex's do you know these like two? Twice as long. <laughs> yeah, I. I have a, a habit of growing my hair out really long. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe I'm just lazy and don't uh, book my haircut appointments. Who knows? <laughs> this this was used our... to be a podcast cover, um, but now it's just kind of a, a cute cartoon of us. So And so we've been business partners and uh, romantic partners and share a lot of common interests. The number one being we both love mushrooms immensely. Um, and I, I'm guessing you guys share the same sentiments as we do. <laughs> now, how I got into mushrooms, I'll start and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Lyra. It started with this red solo cup. I'm sure people have seen this. My first introductory experience with mushrooms was the first week of college. So I'm sure a lot of people, if they went to college, they might have seen quite a few of these red solo cups and, and maybe for them it was filled with beer or some alcoholic beverage. For me, I was handed a red solo cup full of um, psilocybe mushrooms. And that was my first experience ever seeing them. Uh, I didn't know what a dose was. I didn't know how much you were supposed to take, et cetera. So, I ate them all on the spot and, you know, years later, I actually weighed them out. It was about 30 grams. And for people who don't know, right, like much about psilocybin or magic mushrooms, um, a good starting amount is like two to three and a half grams. So this was well beyond a starting dose. And needless to say, I had an extremely life altering experience and was dealing with depression, anxiety at the time in clinical. I was on pharmaceutical medication and uh, was addicted to smoking cigarettes and drank a lot of alcohol, etc. Overnight, I was able to flush all my medication down the toilet. I stopped smoking cigarettes. I changed my friend group. I totally radically like overnight changed my life. And from there, that was my incubation into the mycological world because from there it was, okay, these are natural. These are growing out of the ground. You know, no one's really talking about it, but there must be more, right? There must be more beyond magic mushrooms. And so I got every book I could off Amazon. I, you know, took every class I could, et cetera. And that's how I got inoculated. <laughs> My inoculation was more about the form. Um, I mentioned I have a degree in linguistics, but I also have a degree in sculpture. And at the end of high school, beginning of college, I always looked to nature for inspiration in 3D forms. I loved amorphous shapes, anything that didn't make sense or was not symmetrical or anything like that. And I remember going to the woods and like looking at the striations of tree bark and just slime molds and anything weird and un unpredictable. And that's when I started to notice more. And I started to ask more questions and that quickly snowballed into reading about mycology, learning that it was, to quote Peter McCoy, this neglected mega science and just all of these other applications that humans have not implemented yet. It excited me a lot and yeah, I, I switched from art and language to science and I've been working with them ever since. 
but this picture just depicts how, you know, that was kind of my first introduction was admiring their morphology. So after I got inoculated and read every book I could, et cetera, and was picking more mushrooms than I could ID uh, before they all rotted on the, on the table, um, just trying to trying to figure out what what what's the deal with mushrooms, right? Um, I did I get an internship at this uh, functional mushroom company that was growing mycelium on grain, uh, the roots of the mushroom on on like uh, I think they were using oats or rye berries at the time, and learned a lot of like lab skills. So beyond ID, I learned you know how to culture a mushroom. Um, how to work with uh, genetics and agar and clean techniques and sterilization and saw on a large scale, okay, how, how does a mushroom company or a mycological company exist? Um, and how do you, how do you support yourself um, paying the bills with mycology? And, and so that was, uh, that was a great experience and it really taught me a lot on the hands-on practical side of uh, mycology in a lab? Uh, my intro to actually working with fungi, I lived in Lawrence, Kansas. I'm from Kansas. And there was a single mushroom farm at the time. This was maybe 2017 uh, called Wakarusa Farms. And I started off just volunteering for this mushroom farmer because all I wanted to do was learn how to grow these things. Um, I was gifted a spore print for Christmas because my brother's girlfriend knew that I loved mushrooms. And I was looking at this spore print and getting so mad that I didn't have the skills to turn it into a mushroom. Despite me reading all of these things about mushrooms and just really loving them, I never was really hands-on with them. So I volunteered at this humble mushroom farm in Lawrence, Kansas, and they had two locations, one up in Lawrence and one in this really insane place called Subtropolis in Kansas City. It's the largest underground man-made cave in the world and it's temperature controlled. So year round, it's around 58 degrees. There's a lot of storage under there, um, a mushroom farm, botanical gardens. It's, it's a really interesting place. Definitely worth a Google or two. Uh, they store some Hollywood films under here too because it's Temperature controlled. It's a really cool place. Yeah, it's definitely like an Atlas Obscura type destination if you do go to Kansas City. Here's a little picture of the inside, not my picture, just one from the internet. I tried so hard to find a picture of this old farm in the cave and I just, I could not, I'm so sorry. Um, but you can picture it, right? Bunch of rocks and then Imagine racks with um, shiitake and piopino and oyster. And, and this is stuff. like right down the road from what CIA? Oh, there's an FBI. FBI? Not the headquarters, <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of um, mysterious things going on in that pocket of Kansas City. Yeah. I love it, you know? So yeah, I learned how to grow them. And my farmer at the time would not let me touch agar. He wouldn't let me in the lab, but I got to work into a, in front of a flow hood and start thinking about space and contamination and realizing that. Everything rots. Everything rots. And that's because there are microbes there are everywhere. Microbes. And the world is filthy, the world is filthy in, that in that manner. And and yeah, I got, yeah, bored, I got bored really quick really of just growing oyster and shiitake and whatnot. So I looked on the internet for some kind of mushroom conference and was at the time very interested in microremediation. So I went to New Moon Mycology Summit where I met Alex, teaching a few courses on cultivation and microremediation. And yeah. That's where we met. And we, we had a question in the chat. Oh yeah, we should leave that up. Where yeah. the, the sculpture was from. And maybe if you wanna log into this, this Zoom as well so we can okay. see the chat um, as well. That sounds good. Um, that sculpture, I made it. It's just clay and um, I believe Ken Ganoderma sinensis. And it's currently in my mom's basement, probably. So after the internship, I um, 
was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in school. I had so many different interests and mycology was definitely number one. Um, but it led me to do a, a field study in Ecuador. So um, this was for three or four months. I was in Ecuador traveling around in different ecosystems and studying biodiversity in different ecosystems and, and the anthropogenic effect on them. So how humans are messing up life, basically. Um, and started studying and researching these um, leaf cutter ants or ada ants, as a lot of people call them. Seems like we're slides are messing up here. Oh, I think it's just loading. I think it's a lag. It's weird. Oh, there we go. And these were super fascinating. And before this trip, I had no idea that leaf cutter ants were actually. I'm sure people have seen them in the lines. They're carrying these little pieces of leaves, but most people don't know that they're taking these leaves back to their nest and munching the leaves up uh, and making a, a leaf mash and inoculating it with mycelium of a local mushroom. There's a couple of different species that they use, but uh, primarily one I'm, I'm forgetting. I think it's a lepiota, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, but they grow the mycelium on this leaf match and they eat it as a, as a sole food source. And they're super sustainable. They don't, they don't clear cut the leaves from one tree. They sustainably harvest only a small percentage of leaves and they, they move on to the next tree. And so I saw this and if anyone knows anything about mushroom farming, most mushrooms are grown in plastic bags. And so the, the kind of skeleton in the closet for, uh, for mushroom farmers is that they have a, a big dumpster in the back filled with plastic bags, which is unfortunate, but this was the first time I'm seeing, okay, these are the most sustainable mushroom farmers or mycelium farmers on the planet. And we could, we could definitely learn a lot from them. Um, and so that, that really inoculated me as well. But the second thing I found in Ecuador in the Amazon rainforest were these cordyceps as people call them, or entomopathogenic fungi, fungi that attack insects and inoculate their, their bodies, sometimes making uh, these fruiting bodies. And this was the first one I found on a weevil, and I was just blown away, you know, as a, as a young kid, you know, seeing, seeing this, it's right out of, out of a sci-fi film, and I was just blown away. And luckily the, um, the group leader at the time was a professional photographer. So we got these amazing uh, photographs of these fungi. So they were growing on all these different types of insects and- uh, just could, really you, could you go back and, and spend a few more seconds yeah, those on, are... on each of those pictures? Cause they're astounding. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so this is the first one I found. On a weevil, uh, it's an Ophiocordyceps species, and um, this was in the lowland Amazon area. Were you looking for it? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I knew they were there. Um, I heard about cordyceps, and I heard that they grew around that area. Um, this was the dry season, so this was about October, November of two thousand, maybe fourteen at this time. So it was the dry season, but they were still out, right? It's the Amazon rainforest, so it's still wet, even in the dry season. And so there were still mushrooms available. Um, another one, same species on a weevil, same species on a weevil. Um, this looks like, I don't know what this insect is, but... You know, you can see the parathesia up here, the spore sacs, um, these little bumps on the top where the spores come out. And they're, they're really cool. I mean, sometimes there's just one mushroom, sometimes there's a bunch, uh, all these different morphologies, they grow in all these different types of insects. Um, and I think this is a locust, uh, it's a corset species. And sometimes it, it looks like a mold, right? Um, and it just kind of looks like this bug covered in this, you know, a lot of times it's green because it's a metarhizium um, species, but sometimes it creates these really cool mushrooms that you can 
you get to see and it helps with ID as well. So yeah, this is growing off a locust. And so in this case, you get a ton of different mushrooms growing off. Sometimes it's just one, depends how lucky you are. And other times, like we found insects that were acting really weird and were, were walking really slow and really lethargic and kind of trying to fly away, but couldn't really, or try, like walking really strangely up a leaf and almost walking zigzag like it was drunk. And a lot of these entomopathogenic fungi will excrete psychoactive compounds to make the inoculation easier uh, for, for the, uh, the insect. And, you know, so you'll see them almost like, they look like they're drunk, um, kind of zigzagging lethargic. And you know, if you come back in a few days, you'll see a cordyceps or an entomopathogenic fungi taking over um, this insect. And a lot of times, you know, they, they need the right humidity to trigger the fruiting. So a lot of times they'll fruit at the same time every day, uh, mostly in the morning around, you know, morning dew, um, it's increased humidity. So they'll, they'll fruit in the mornings and it depends on where they fruit. I was always looking about eye height under underneath leaves, but other species will grow in the soil and they'll just pop out or in a log. Um, yeah, so it really, really depends, but I was looking underneath leaves and that for me is the easiest. Um, Acanthomyces on a moth. We should share our cordyceps hunting tip. So if you go at night and you have a flashlight, you go to the trees and flash from above and some leaves will have a dark spot. And it's much easier to sort them out through the foliage that way than during the day. Definitely not my tip. I think kind of like kind of like putting horse blinders on, mm -hmm. you know, with all the foliage and all these different things, your brain can get overwhelmed. So just kind of limiting your sensory input to just a, a certain circle of light uh, can help you find it. Um, but just looking for me, it's easiest when you're looking underneath leaves because you just see that dark spot and then you look and sometimes it's like a a piece of dirt or an alive insect um, or something, but you always check and most often uh, it'll be a cordyceps. That so I was geeking out about mushrooms, you know, and, and was finding way more than the leaf cutter ants and the cordyceps, all these different mushrooms. And uh, until I found, um, we were at the Yasuni research station, which is the most biodiverse uh, region on the planet in the Amazon rainforest. And it is home for the uh, Warani people, which is an indigenous tribe in Ecuador, uh, the biggest indigenous tribe. And they were displaced by this oil company. Um, and I got to interview, you know, from the grandparents to the kids and their experiences uh, with this displacement from the oil company. And, and, you know, it was devastating to see you know, much higher rates of cancer. Um, they were a nomadic tribe, but after the oil company came, they built them houses and all these different things. So their whole way of life was disrupted. And on a walk one day, I saw these unlined pits of oil um, and it was just reeking of, of oil. And you could see the, the multicolored steam coming up. I don't know how to, what that's called, but um, and it and it, all the life around the oil pits was just dead, you know. And it was it was it was really sad to see. And at the time, I was reading how fungi could, you know, degrade oil in the environment and break it down into uh, sustainable, um, smaller sustainable bits to be to clean it up. So it inspired me to come back home and and dedicate at least the next few years of my life to researching micromediation. And this was not soon after I, I quit smoking cigarettes. So um, that was the first kind of project for me is, okay, let's grow some mushrooms off cigarette butts. And so I was collecting all these cigarette butts in a five gallon bucket and growing mycelium on it. And, you know, I was doing it for a few months and I totally forgot about it. And I put it in my basement and I put a lid over it 
And a few months later, I was cleaning in my basement and I found the five gallon bucket. And I was like, oh, I totally forgot about this. I lifted up, opened the lid. And you can see on the picture of the right, all these mushrooms, these oyster mushrooms were growing out. And I picked them out. And you can see in the picture on the, the right, the mushrooms were actually growing out of the cigarette butts. And they're made of uh, cellulose acetate, which is a plasticized um, like natural fiber. So it's a type of plastic and full of carcinogens like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and really a lot of nasty stuff. So to see a mushroom growing off of it is, is astounding. Um, and so I did some research on it. Um, my final thesis for school, I, I, I wrote this book on micromediation. If anyone's interested in reading it, we, you know, I, it's not in print anymore, but I'll send anyone the PDF. So definitely reach out. I'll send you the PDF of the book. Uh, but I found, was doing tests on PAH degradation. So polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, super carcinogenic, really bad for you. And in under 14 days, the enzymes from these oyster mushrooms were able to degrade them entirely. So, or below detectable limits. So this was amazing and, and uh, really inspired me, you know, um, that, that this was, this was possible and a, and a potential solution. And I even concocted this crazy idea, which I haven't, I haven't done, haven't seen anyone do it, but I, I think it'd be cool to, you know, with all these forest fires going on, it'd be, be really funny to, and, and, you know, a, a great idea to, to, um, load up these enzymes into these planes, right. That can drop 3000 gallons of, of liquid and just spray it over an oil, oil, uh, spill, or, you know, once a pipeline breaks, it's not if, but when, you know, we're ready to drop 3000 gallons of, uh, of these enzymes. So this is, this is what the, the oyster mushrooms look like growing on this big cake of cigarette butts. And it fruited about eight times, you know, oh and, and most people who grow oyster mushrooms, it only fruits like three, if it fruits four times, you're lucky, you know, but eight times was crazy. I don't know why, but um, yeah. So I, I developed a strain that was, that was targeted specifically to degrade cigarette butts and the, the toxins within um, and yeah, it was fun to do it. It was smelly and gross, but it, it definitely was, it was fun for sure. So do you think you could get the uh, tobacco companies to include a packet of mycelium in, in every, um, every carton? Well, hope. Yeah. I was only, I was trying to figure out a way to measure how, how well it degraded the actual, um, uh, cellulose acetate, which is the plastic piece, but I couldn't figure out a good way to measure that. Um, so I only focused on polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and also heavy metals. And for those, that's great. But I think, you know, we just did a podcast released last week, um, or this week, sorry, uh, on plastic degradation from fungi, and we have a long way to go. So hopefully one day that will be a possibility for any plastic you get from any packaging just comes along with your mycelial uh, component to degrade it. Or, or we just don't use the plastic. Yeah, or it's just made out of mycelium in the first place. Yeah. So, so did, you, did know, you eat or taste any of those oysters? No, so another, another aspect I did was um, testing the heavy metals from the actual fruiting bodies of the, the oyster mushrooms. And they are toxic. They have a high level of heavy metals. So they pull the heavy metals from the right. cigarette filters. Um, so you don't want to eat them. And, and any, any mushrooms growing off toxic substances or even by a roadway, you don't want to eat because uh, they hyperaccumulate heavy metals. But I had my own inoculation with toxic substances. I got um, hit with Lyme disease. And for anyone who's lived in the Northeast or knows anything about Lyme disease, it's a a disease carried by ticks and it totally turns your life 180 degrees. I mean, I was bedridden, painful joints, brain fog, the whole works. Um, and 
through this, I dedicated my life to, to living a healthier way of life uh, and found functional mushrooms to be super supportive for supporting my overall health. And uh, that was my inspiration for starting Mushroom Revival to, you know, um, help other people gain access to functional mushrooms uh, to support their health. We have a question from Josh. What did you do with those mushrooms? Um, I had to dispose of them. And unfortunately, yeah, I mean, it was great research, but at the end, I probably made more waste than I did clean up. <laughs> and that is a problem with a lot of like grassroots remediation is that it's done at such a small scale that you probably make more plastic and waste trying to clean up such a small thing than you do benefit. But I, I think it was a good starting point for inspiration to do this at a larger scale. Um, and I've seen a, a couple of people do cigarette remediation with fungus at a larger scale, which I, I think is good. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, but it really inspired me to, you know, mushrooms, I, I feel like, you know, especially with micro remediation or functional mushrooms, um, it can be easy to, to put them in a box uh, and to think, you know, micro remediation is only fungi that can degrade toxic waste, but uh, I think it's important for the, the body, earth, and mind. Um, and uh, around this time... Oh, I was just going to say one thing, which, you know, when we saw you in Colorado, you said in retrospect, you think you'd had Lyme disease since you were pretty young. I don't remember how old, but um, I don't remember what age you said you thought you'd probably contracted it. Yeah, probably young. And I, I got bit quite a few times. Um, the time around probably 2015 uh, was really when it hit me hard. Um, and, you know, everyone gets different concoctions when they're bit and different levels of the toxins. Um, and so for me at that time, I, I think I got bit pretty hard. Um, whereas a kid, I, I, I think it was pretty manageable. Um, but during this time, you know, I, I came back from Ecuador and started looking for cordyceps in the U.S. And for us in the U.S., probably our most common species is cordyceps militaris. We also have, you know, it got kicked out of the cordyceps um, genus, but... Uh, Tolipocladium. Tolipocladium so which grows on a, a deer truffle. But, but this was awesome to find. Um, and at the time I was looking for ways to support my energy. So, you know, started growing it to have my own kind of pharmacy in, in my, uh, in my room at the time, growing my book, started growing them growing with, your book. with, with different plants and to cycle the CO2 and oxygen, you know, grew some hydroponic plants to cycle the CO2 and oxygen um, and growing other mushrooms as well, just trying to trying to replicate the ecosystems that I saw in Ecuador. So, so growing mushrooms and plants together. And this was this was kind of the start of mushroom revival. I, I was working at a local mushroom farm and just kind of learning, okay, at a small scale, how does this work? And over time, you know, I got keys to a local university laboratory. And I took the night shift. So I was working from like midnight to 4 a.m. And um, just trying to sterilize things, use the flow hood and start growing cordyceps and all these different types of mushrooms. And over time, I, I uh, saved up to, to, to buy these pressure cookers, which, you know, sterilized media to grow mushrooms on and started growing them you know, at a, at a semi-large scale um, and trying all these different things specifically for cordyceps militaris. And this was, you know, it's growing in these little plastic jars. Um, I think there's a lag. Um, growing them in these trays, in the bags uh, and trying all these techniques. And I was, at that time, I was growing in my living room um, and in my basement in my dining room at this house that I was renting and sharing with other people until they respectfully told me, 
you know, you should probably find another place to grow these mushrooms. So I found this amazing um, warehouse and it was built by these Amish carpenters, um, beautiful woodwork. And it was a, it was amazing space to start out with. And we started, you know, we just threw things together. I mean, these are shoe racks that we um, bolted to planks of wood, which had wheels on the bottom and these string lights and the walls were made of poly plastic that we stapled to the wall. And you know, we just did what we could, you know, on a lo low budget. These are cake pans that we made. Um, and we grew in these tubs, which is pretty common for psilocybe cultivation, but you know, we said, Hey, they're pretty similar to cordyceps. So we grew them in these tubs and there's two questions. Um, one from Josh recommendations for a flow hood. There's a company called Enviroco that actually makes ceiling units. You can buy it directly from them. It's probably 1400 or be patient with a certain seller on eBay that sells it for 900. Um, or less. I've, I've gotten flow hoods for like 400 on eBay. And they're really nice in Enviroco ceiling, yeah. ceiling units and they have a fan filter in it. Um, and so it's all in one. Don't get a flow, don't make your own. I've made many flow hoods in the past and they're they're just bad. Yeah. And you're gonna spend just as much money as you buying an actual metal tight one. They're big, they're bulky, they're made out of wood. They're not good. Um, I would just get an Enviroco ceiling fan filter unit. And the next question is about needing insects to grow cordyceps militaris. You don't, um, which is unique for a cordyceps fungus. You, we grew it on rice, supplemented brown and or white rice. And there's a ton of other grains and substrates you can use that are vegetarian as well. So continue. Yeah, so right down the road, we had no idea when we moved in, but right down the road, like seven minutes away, there was this big mushroom farm and they had this, one of the biggest autoclaves in the country, believe it or not. And I had no idea when we moved in and we got talking and they said, Hey, we don't use it on the weekends. If you guys want to rent it out, you totally can. So we did. And we went during some weekends. And, uh, at that time we were working seven days a week, just crazy hours and we made it work. And so we, you know, had some volunteers. And at that time I had one employee and he had his kid on the weekends that he had to look, look after. And so we had to make these games for his kid uh, while he worked. And so we like, you know, it, it, here's him in the autoclave. You can see the scale. And so we, we told him that was a, a time machine and we had all these different things that we had to make up. Um, and we had fun and we started growing them in these, these bins. And you see, this is rice that is growing in totally vegan. No, no, no uh, insects that we used. Here we got the lag again. I see it pixelating slowly. Yeah, it's like <laughs> just starting at the top, but. So we can ask people to turn off their video. That actually usually helps if you're having some lag. Here we go. Yeah, so this is us in the lab. We, as you, I mean, you can see right behind us, we'd like uh, weird color lights. And so we had the red and pink colored lights going on. They're not functional whatsoever. They're just, we like them. <laughs> and so we were growing all these bins and we weren't having much luck with them. And at the same, about this time is where we met at that uh, mushroom conference. And um, Lyra came on our team and we started figuring out how to actually grow these legit. You want to talk about our, our first date? Yeah, this was sometime October 2018. Um, Alex invited me to go mushroom hunting, and I just moved to Massachusetts from Kansas. And I didn't know a whole lot about mushroom foraging to begin with. I knew very little about the local environment back in Kansas City. But I was blown away when I came to Massachusetts in the fall. I mean, the fungal abundance was just something I had never personally experienced. And I had this mission of finding a mushroom in every color. He was like, what do you want to find? 
I was like, I want to find a red one, an orange one, a yellow one, you know, blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, we did. Um, this chicken of the woods flesh was probably the most impressive and delicious. I got to eat it. We cooked it up. It was great. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, time. within minutes of me asking, what do you want to find? She said, oh, I want to find blue stain and blue stain fungus. And I was like, oh, I don't know if we're going to find it, but yeah, maybe we, we'll put it on our, our, uh, our list. And literally within 30 seconds, I picked up a stick because there was a fork in the path and the stick that I picked up blue stain. And she was like, oh, I want to find lion's mane. We find lion's mane within 30 seconds. <laughs> She's like, oh, I want to find um, stink horn. Stink horn. Yeah, we find stink horn. Then, and she's like, oh, I want to find hen of the woods. We found hen of the woods within 30 seconds. And then uh, she's like, okay, I want to really find, I want to find chicken in the woods. Um, and so we finish up the hike and we haven't found chicken in the woods yet. And then we're literally pulling out and, or we're walking to our car. We're, we're at our car with our basket full of mushrooms and someone comes in they're leaving and they said, hey, um, and they see our mushrooms and they're like, you know what? I was just on a run and I saw this orange thing on this tree down the path. I don't know if it's a mushroom, but y'all should check it out. And there you go. That's what we found, this beautiful chicken of the woods. Um, and this, I feel like you have a, a magic sense with, with <laughs> mushrooms. You just call it out into the universe and it appears. So same year, this was like December at this point. I think early December, late November. And it's very cold. We're bundled up. It's about to snow. And she goes, oh, I really want to find cordyceps. And I'm like, we're not going to find any cordyceps. <laughs> it is almost it is like winter time right now. That's not going to happen. And within five seconds, we look at the hill, literally within five seconds, we look at the hill and this is what we see. It's Cordyceps capitata, which is growing on an Elaphomycete truffle. And it's- And apparently six heads on one truffle is impressive. This was the first one I ever encountered in person, but I guess usually they're one to three and three is considered good. Yeah, usually so it's, it's was... one mushroom growing off of it. So six of them popping out was unheard of. And yeah, literally within five seconds of me being like, no way we're gonna find cordyceps. And this is literally this is what happens with morels too. I the second I give up finding morels, I say, you know what? I'm not gonna find morels. I look down, there's a morel. And I don't know <laughs> what it is, but they're just toying with me. Um, that's how I find mushrooms, I guess. But going back to cordyceps, we, you know, while the, we're the bends were failing. Yeah. And when I got there, everything got contaminated, mostly because the tape we chose to use had two problems. You couldn't autoclave it and it wasn't waterproof. And the waterproof thing isn't a problem for the first one to four weeks of incubation, but it eventually quickly becomes a problem. So the tape unseals and things get in there. Trike. We became a trike farm. Yeah. And all of those bins, except for like one and a half compost or pig food or chicken feed or something we we're growing so a lot of mold <laughs> we were like screw this let's just do the jars because we need mushrooms to sustain this business and that's where this um daunting batch comes from so each each batch um each run in the autoclave could fit 5134 jars which is a lot of mason jars right and so i bought the cheapest mason jars I could off a wholesale dealer and they were narrow mouth, the, the <laughs> cheapest ones I could find, like a third of the price of anything out there. And um, we just got these pallets, you know, arrived and we, we had to make, we're like, okay, we're not going to individually pick up five, you know, 5,100 jars. So we made these little like um, aluminum boats that can carry six at a time, you know, just a little bit better. And so we're folding all these aluminum carrying containers and uh, we had all these volunteers come and we had all this food and music and gave them a bunch of free stuff. And um, 
you know, lots of hands makes makes the dream come true. Um, so we, we filled each jar with rice and then here's Lyra making this nutrient broth. Uh, and then we, so the lids of the jar, we had to drill a hole in each of these lids and that, you know, the 5,100 jars was per run and we were doing multiple runs. So we had tens of thousands of these jars and, um, and, and then we had to, to stuff the holes with polyfill or pillow stuffing. So we bought all these pillows wholesale, pillows wholesale. And- um, They're way cheaper than polyfill. We were just sitting on the couch, watching documentaries, just stuffing holes in these mason jar lids for days and days. Um, and so here's our jars. We put the lids on, put them in boats, uh, put them on these racks that we put in the autoclave. We'd cook them. And here's the other side where we had our Tyvek suits to be super clean and sterile. Remember, we only had extra large. Super I, baggy. I was like swimming in these yeah. Tyvek suits, but they did the job. Um, Some people called us Ghostbusters because of this weird lighting and our, our Tyvek suits. And um, yeah, we had these automatic syringe guns that they used for, I think. Those were cool. They were like animal vaccination yeah. guns, but... You put the, the hose into your liquid culture and you can set the mill that it deposits. So I think we did five mil, four or five mil per jar. You could just squirt, 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 squirt. If it wasn't for that, that would have taken probably five times as long. It did take a, a, a while, but we got it done. And I don't know what happened with that picture, but this is, this is our, our U-Haul with our 5,100 jars, um, cause we had to drive the six minutes down the road. And it was like this dirt road in Western Massachusetts that had all of these potholes in it. And so we we're, you know, we had all these racks in there too. And, um, we, I drove like half a mile per hour down this <laughs> crazy road and everything was jiggling in the back. And, uh, we made it happen, you know, and it was, we we're so lucky. It was only six minutes down the road and not hours away uh and then this is our our farm all grown up mm -hmm. all our jars this is probably like fifteen thousand jars in here and you know they were all growing we had all these cheeto looking mushrooms we had these cannabis lights which were like red blue white lights which made this pink purple color kind of looked like you're walking into a spaceship this is all the the mushrooms growing and so we're doing multiple batches and they take a couple months to grow. And so we're, we're, you know, working all these jars until it came time to, to harvest. And you want to tell this story? Well, we were on a budget. So we went with the regular mouth jars. So it saved us four digits at least of spending. And yeah, come harvest time, you can't fit your hand inside the jar. And like, we thought about that, but we didn't realize just how annoying it would be when you try to do 15,000. So yeah, we got these plastic knives made for kids so that we could cut the cake in half. And Bef like- Before we used metal knives. Yeah, I guess we started there, kept breaking the glass. Um, but there was no great way to get the cake out. You had to cut it to get it out of the mouth, so. I got really good at this one motion um, and <laughs> <laughs> you need, need to, to hire, hire someone. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yep. That's, that's child labor. I, I didn't think we would go that far. Um, we, but, we just took their knives uh, to, to get them out. Yeah. The thing is it worked. And what this really was showing us at that time was this is not sustainable. We need to try bins again. So so lots of R and D over many, many, many months, a lot of, still a lot of failure, a lot of kinks to work out, but we made it happen. This is half the cake that we had to wiggle out of the jar. Um, yeah, we, we also partnered with Bastyr University for a couple years in a row. Um, we had a colleague there, Rishi Strauss, to, and she was wrapping up her time there. So she, 
did this study with our cordyceps um, comparing the mycelium uh, versus the fruiting bodies or the actual mushrooms and, and looking at specifically cordycepin and adenosine, which are the two main functional compounds in cordyceps militaris for energy support, which people normally take cordyceps for. And we found that the fruiting bodies or the actual mushrooms of cordyceps had 51, about 51 times more cordycepin and about seven times more adenosine than the mycelium. And for anyone who ever makes tinctures, we also did some, you know, best practices for extracting cordyceps for cordycepin and adenosine. Um, these were some of our, our findings. You can screenshot it if you want. Um, but, but this was, this was cool. And, and at the time we, you know, we only harvested the, the mushrooms and, and we didn't do anything with the mycelium. You know, we gave them to local farms to compost. Um, but we also cook them as well. And so they're like tempeh, if anyone has said tempeh. And this one dinner party, we actually made dolmas with, with uh, the cordyceps mycelium. They're really great with stir fries. Uh, you can make a little like pat, like a burger patty with it or tacos. Um, they're super good. But better as a food, less for, you know, functional uh, health benefits. So Josh, the substrate was usually white rice that we cooked with a nutrient dense broth that was nutritional yeast, malt, and potato starch. So this was way in the beginning, probably before earlier in their timeline, but we you know, I printed these labels off my home printer <laughs> and the first batch was not waterproof. So people would use these tinctures and it would drip and the ink would run. Um, and I printed them every time someone had an order and you could see like the two ounce we had to write with Sharpie. I mean, it was bad. It was really bad. They're like all over the place and it wasn't bad, but it was a starting place. And you know, at the, and at the start, we were wild foraging these mushrooms and, you know, getting them locally because because we were so small at that time we could. Um, but probably didn't have the best sanitary practices in the world. Uh, we probably weren't up to code 100 percent, but we're just kind of learning on on how to do things. Um, and we also had capsules at the time where we hand made all these capsules uh, and they were a nightmare. Every single bottle took like an hour to make <laughs> and they weren't worth it uh, at the end. And we had all these different species and um, they were great, but you know, not really worth it for us at that scale. And then we upgraded. So we got our organic certification, which we were helped out a lot with. And that was a nightmare you know, as a farmer, dealing with mountains of paperwork is not uh, the best thing in the world. You want to get back to farming. So we bit the bullet and uh, filled out so much paperwork to get our organic certification. And we changed our labels, changed our logo. Um, and we were the first certified organic cordyceps farm in the U.S., in the Americas, in this half of the globe, actually, um, and the largest Cordyceps Militaris mushroom farm uh, in this half of the globe as well. So, but our scale was very small. So that's that's saying a lot that you know North America is pretty behind in mushroom cultivation and mushroom culture. Period. Uh, we were also the first to have uh, cordyceps in a fully compostable bag, which was fun, and we we had this. We sold it for people that wanted to make their own tea and things like that. Um, and so we're really, we're really excited to lessen our uh, plastic impact and use fully biodegradable plant-based packaging, which was good. Um, and we're making everything in a commercial kitchen and had the hair nets and everything until we, we made our own kind of kitchen space in our own facility. And we, uh, we got the local certifications and everything for food safety. Uh, but we had to drive all of our 
our things in our trunk and unload and everything at this commercial kitchen. Um, and we had a lot of fun. But this is about the time where, you know, we, ha we had to figure out this, this uh, method to not grow cordyceps in jars. So Lyra was kind of the lead person on this tech. So I'll let her talk about it. Sure. So autoclaving bins is not easy. And we had we had to go down the street and use a big autoclave. But it would be really great to do this in-house. So <laughs> there's just so so many um nights of brainstorming and just trying to figure out how can we grow cordyceps in bins in-house. And we coined it the dumpling method, but really the secret is we just used a silicone dough kneading bag. I guess this exists for people who don't want to touch the dough that they're using when they're making bread or pizza crust or something. But thank God that this commodity existed because I tried to make it. I worked with silicone a ton in my college years. Oh, you sculpture. did. I forgot about that. I tried that. to make one and it worked, but like it just... It was more time than, than needed. And I looked everywhere online, sure enough, a product like this exists. And the great thing about these bags is you can autoclave them probably a hundred times before they give out. They're super flexible and you can really be rough with them. So we tried this method just in plastic bags and they, after like the third or fourth cook kind of give out. So it's wasteful and they break very easily. And when we inoculate a bag of rice that we just cooked, we want to massage the grain and get that liquid culture evenly distributed so that we get a flush that looks even and consistent, yada, yada. So yeah, we were just looking for alternative bags and that turned out to be really instrumental for us. And there's a whole YouTube video on this. I'm glazing over a lot of the other essential parts of this tech, but if you are interested in commercializing Cordyceps Militaris, check it out. Uh, maybe there's something useful in there for you. And yeah, I mean, we were able to produce, I think like 10 times as much in one day than we could with jars. So within a week, we're like a month or three ahead, you know, um, it was really, really we Great, don't, too. yeah, we don't have a picture of the silicone dough bag, but picture a just like a silicone bag um, about this big. And, um, but it's on YouTube. If you just look up, you know, Mushroom Revival on YouTube. Uh, uh, commercial Cordyceps Cultivation. I think it's the first one that comes up. Yep. And you can see our whole technique. And we had a, a period of time where, you know, we were thinking of, okay, do we patent this technique? I mean, this is new to the industry. I mean, this is a great technique or do we keep it proprietary? Like, what do we do with this? Um, but, but those two options didn't feel right. And so we decided to open source it, make it for free. We did also didn't want to charge people for it. We had all these people asking, you know, for us to consult them and um, no, we just keep it free and uh so lyra took on the task of recording the video and editing it and um making this free video for people which i i think is great trying to make more organic farmers more mushroom farmers um more cordyceps farmers more people that can have access to this which i think is great because we're so far behind here in the u.s you know if if you go to china or thailand even japan um, and, uh, you know, a lot of countries way, you know, they're, they're like hundreds of years ahead of us in terms of mushroom cultivation and science. And so, yeah, we, we got to do what we can to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make sure that we can, we can actually catch up. It's worth saying cordyceps are not difficult to grow if you have good genetics and there's no need to do this amount of insanity unless you really are trying to be a commercial farm. Yeah. Um, there's so many other ways to grow them that are foolproof and beautiful and honest on like home scale jars are great yeah or even like small bins that you can put inside of a bag or trays or something um but yeah yeah and i think this was you know coming from my experience of 
of, uh, you know, I've been in the commercial gourmet mushroom industry for a while and, you know, growing thousands and thousands of pounds of, of gourmet fresh mushrooms. And so is Lyra. And the one thing I was talking about before, there's so much plastic bag usage and, um, and, uh, as you can see on the left, these, these poly polypropylene number five bags, which are incredibly hard to break down. I mean, they probably take thousands of years to break down. If even, I, I don't think we actually know. Um, they're one of the hardest plastics to break down and, and it sucks. And so, so one thing that we wanted to do, especially with the cordyceps is not grow them in those bags. And so we wanted to use uh, reusable glass jars or these reusable you know, they're still plastic, but we can reuse them over and over again. Um, and, you know, growing mushrooms on logs and only sourcing from, from farms that will grow them on logs or doing it in a little bit more sustainable way. Um, also with Mushroom Revival, we plant a tree for every product that we sell. And this was a big piece for us is, okay, how do we do this in a sustainably conscious way? right? Environmentally, sustainably conscious way. Um, and we're not perfect, but just trying to make as much progress towards uh, a more sustainable future. Did we look at Japanese bottle system as well? Um, yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the glass jars are pretty close to the Japanese bottle system. Um, we were talking with, with some people that are growing in those jars. And we are currently um, getting some maitake that's grown that way um, and some other mushroom. So it's definitely in our sourcing and, and our partnerships with other farms. But uh, the Japanese bottle system, if people don't know, it's a fully automated mushroom farm that uses these, these plastic. Actually, I have a picture of it in the last slide with this maitake. So they've grown these jars in these bottles and they work in this fully automatic uh mushroom cultivation system whoop i move this back over uh and it's it's really great and i i think it's one of the best mushroom farming techniques in the world and and something that i've been really inspired a lot uh by is the mushroom culture in china you know i i went a couple years ago for a uh, medicinal mushroom conference and I met this researcher, Yushui Tan, who grew 91 different types of cordyceps, which is unheard of. Here in the US, I think we've grown 16 different kinds. And so 91 is mind blowing. Uh, and he was so humble. Um, you know, we were growing maybe hundreds, if not maybe a thousand dried pounds of cordyceps or a couple, I don't know how much we were growing. Um, but in China, they're growing hundreds of millions of dried pounds. Um, so the scale is unbelievable. And I actually, you know, got to visit this cordyceps museum there and, and it was just incredibly inspiring. Um, and so we have a long way to go and I, I would love to see more mushroom museums in the U S and, and other countries around the world. I'll let you go. Cause this was, <laughs> this is your baby. Okay. Um, when we weren't farming a mushroom revival, we were having meetings about any new innovation we could bring, um, you know, ways to market ourselves and just do something unique. And I was an avid podcast listener before and always wished that there was a mushroom podcast. And there were a few out there, um, but not like as comprehensive as I wanted them to be or as consistent. Like I was used to weekly shows with a lot of dense information um, in regards to whatever topic, you know. And there wasn't a podcast out there that... Um that lasted, there was, there was a couple out there that only made a couple episodes and then stopped, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I was hesitant at first. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not a podcast listener. I don't have time. I was into audiobooks uh, because I had a long commute, but you know, 
yeah, she was super excited about podcasts. I was like, I don't know. That seems like a lot of work. Who, who listens to podcasts? I don't know. And so we did one episode and we, we didn't script it at all. We just did it. Um, and it was a success. Yeah, I mean, we got a good response from people. It seemed like there was more interest than we thought and kept rolling with it. You look at the analytics, it's just more and more interest. Um, and that was over two years ago now, I believe. So we just released episode 123 and we still have so much more to go. We thought we'd run out of topics by episode 30. and through this podcast that honestly has been the most illuminating thing for me and you and i'm sure other people for how vast this world of fungi is i mean it truly is an entire kingdom the applications are unexplored and <laughs> this is our, you see our puppy <laughs> getting a little restless um but yeah you know so many topics so many more to go yeah, it's easy to get into a um what do you call chamber? it? Yeah, an echo chamber in the in the mycological whatever mycological niche niche that you're in. It's easy to kind of put your horse blinders on and and think, okay, this is the whole mycological world or the micro the myco community. But through our research of just like trying to find guests, we're blown away how large the myco community is and and how international it is and just like it yeah there there are the usual suspects that take a lot of the the spotlight so to speak but you know there's so many amazing researchers that just do not like getting in front of a camera or do not have a social media or you know they're only on research gate and only a, a select few people know them but they're doing amazing things to prog progress yeah. the the um mycology industry and and sciences so most cutting edge mycology seems to be done in under the radar completely yeah. so we really try to expose that to people um sam and cornelia ask can we share any highlights of our podcast there's so many i love every episode um there's been so many i mean if you ask me tomorrow i'd probably say something different but like Merlin Sheldrake, we had him on right before he released his book and he was so generous to give us a PDF watermarked so we could read it before he released it. And I just was like, I have so much reverence for this. It is a true masterpiece on mycology. And if none of you have read it, you must. Um, it'll make you fall in love all, on, all over again with the fungal kingdom. But- In the picture we have Eleanor Shavit, which uh, she was just at, Mycelium Mysteries um, with mm -hmm. Juliana Furchi. We also had her on and uh, so many people and so many people that are on the waiting list to get on. And, and lots of people you've probably never heard of, you know, like researchers from small towns all the way across the world. I missed the name of, uh, the name is Entangled Life. I did not say it. So thank you for asking. Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrick. Entangled Life. Yeah. Um, yeah I he's mean, so i mean he's just so humble he knows his stuff such an in, interesting family you know it, it's not just him but his whole family um is is so unique yeah um really great stories in there and so eloquent and articulate and how he and poetic and how he describes his interactions with with the uh, with mycology so that that was a really good one i mean we it's like picking your favorite kid i mean it's it's hard mm -hmm. we just had a um uh, a halloween special which i really liked a lot of spooky facts i like the spooky side of of mycology so that was a fun fun i episode. think um, besides our mycology 101 episode the, the best performing one is know your fungus with larry evans so you, i'm sure a lot of you know who larry evans is that was a fun one yeah he's funny it's like half Half mycology, half comedy. Yeah, it's great. a lot of great stories. Um, can you cook with tinctures and or extracts? What about baking? Does the heat do anything to it? Yes, you can, but there is some such thing as too hot. 
So I don't know about baking. Yeah, I wouldn't. I would, yeah. Smoothies, like salad dressing, sauce, you know, add it to your food maybe after you've heated it in the skillet or whatever. But do we typically see Parathesia on our cordyceps fruit bodies? I've only fruited them once and it was all Canadia. Usually, yes. But I also have grown many sterile cordyceps mushrooms. Yeah, they should have parathesia and and may, I mean they take a bit to um to produce and a lot of cultures that you get some will be sterile and so they'll you know they will not produce parathesia but um you should see them and they're kind of the last to grow they're the last stage so you know maybe you, you didn't wait long enough maybe it was a sterile culture who knows so just because we do have a few people that are really brand new, can you explain Parathesia and Conidia to people? Okay. Yeah, I am um, to maybe to boil it down there. Uh, maybe I can go back to a, a picture of it really quick. Um, if we have a cordy close up. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so maybe you can see it if you really squint these little bumps. On here, I know there was a better picture before, but there are these little bumps on uh, on the stroma. They're and, the Cheeto dust. Of the, yeah, Cheeto of the dust. Cheeto. And, and basically what they are is just kind of spore sacs. And so <laughs> uh, there's kind of these structures that hold the spores. And um, yeah, that, I think that's the... the <laughs> how I can explain it. Oh, we, um, so one of the farmers who worked at Mushroom Revival was a chef and we, we scraped up off the Cheeto dust and he mixed it with salt because cordyceps Ooh, taste yeah. like, I'm not even kidding, like kind of cheesy. They really do. It's like nutritional yeast almost. And um, it was 50% cordy dust and 50% salt. Phenomenal. Super good. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with functional mushrooms, um, saffron. Yeah. Probably similar price yeah. point too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It is kind of saffron-y when I think about it. It is, it totally is for sure. Yeah. A lot of fun things you could do. Uh, the world is your oyster pretty much. And, and we're seeing that a lot. So many different companies are just putting functional mushrooms in anything you could possibly imagine. Um, you know, we've made cordyceps lollipops at one point. You know, we're about to release the world's first organic mushroom gummies, cordyceps gummies. Um, I've made like cordyceps fruit roll-ups at one point. Um, you could you could do some really cool stuff. But you know, what one thing that has been the backbone of you know be being part of the business world is, is making a good impact on the world. So, you know, trying to use less plastic, um, planting trees, you know, we planted over 43,000 trees around the world. This is a picture from, uh, a planting site in Rwanda. Um, this is a women's co-op in Rwanda, um, where we planted a thousand or one or 2000 trees there. Um, mostly we plant in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest, but, you know, um, just any way that we can make some sort of beneficial impact. And again, we're not perfect. You know, another initiative that we did, we donated over $15,000 worth of herbal extracts to the BIPOC communities in the U S during COVID, uh, to help support immune systems in this weird, weird time. Um, you know, and, and if, if there's any business owners out there, even conscious consumers, I mean, th these are not the only ways you can help, you know, be a good person or, you know, at least try, but in this weird world that we're in right now, I, I think it's really important to, to at least try to make an impact. Um, then on more of a selfish, uh, front, we are, we are launching a ton of new products soon. So next week, we're actually launching the world's first certified organic mushroom capsules. Uh, the week after, we're launching a whole line of organic mushroom powders, which we worked so hard to formulate to make them taste really, really, really good. 
Um, and so they'll pair really well in a smoothie or coffee or, you know, things like that. Um, and then we have the world's first certified organic mushroom gummies. They also taste really, really good. Um, and then we, we currently have a line of tinctures as well. And so we work with 10 different types of functional mushrooms. Chaga and Poria Cocos are, are technically sclerotia, but, you know, 10 different mushrooms. Uh, Ra, do we grow tremella? No, we do not. It'd be cool to do that one day. We, we partner with a tremella farm. So we, we do work with tremella. We love tremella. One of our favorite mushrooms of all time. Um, yeah, love it. Love it. And that, that's one of our mushrooms in our daily 10 formula that we use. Um, I guess this was in an awkward positioning, but yeah, I have started working for a biotech company here in Austin, Texas. So there's a lot of really great biotech going on in the city. And um, if you haven't heard of the ODIN, it stands for the Open Discovery Institute. And it's basically just about democratizing science. We, the ODIN did not have much of a mycology department at the time. Um, I interviewed with my boss and he was really keen to introduce more fungi into the science education kits that we make. So people can buy kits to do genetic engineering at home. You can work with CRISPR, you can grow bioluminescent bacteria, you can discover antibiotics at home. And it's a really wonderful place to work with um, a really different approach on what it means to be a scientist. And I put this photo up. This is a mural at work. It's one of the walls in our lab. And that just kind of encapsulates and, and showcases the informality and beauty really that we're trying to incorporate into science. Um, make it approachable, make it fun, make it not so serious and sterile lab coat. So my boss is super generous. We sell an entire home lab kit. You get a PCR machine, um, a gel box, all the media you would need, pipettes, everything um, for just under $2,000, which is that's a crazy steal. And we refurbish all the machinery. Um, we really try to give you the best price point. And yeah, some things that we've been up to at the Odin in terms of the mycology department. Uh, here's just some photos. This, these, this is my coworker doing some human cell culture. And that's a kit that we sell. You can grow your own and engineer your own human cells. And this photo on the right is our cell culture space within the lab. And there's a film crew because we're making a documentary called Biohack the Planet. Hopefully episode one will be out before 2022, but we'll see about that. Um, but yeah, it's just, you can see the color of walls. You know, we got a blue wall, we have a pink wall, crazy lights, it's a fun time. Um, and I, I'm starting to get super experimental in the lab and collaborate with non-mycologists. And I cannot tell you how useful this has been for me because I didn't come from a science background at all. Every bit of scientific knowledge that I knew about anything molecular or tiny came from growing mushrooms. And you can learn a lot from growing mushrooms, you know, way more than growing plants. But now I'm interacting with biologists and biohackers and people who made their own COVID vaccine. I mean, they're, they're really um, cutting edge and pretty bold with the projects that they do. And I'm so impressed by what they're able to produce all the time. So long story short, they have projected a whole new lens on what it means to grow fungus for me. And a few things that we're working on is reinventing the microcomposites. So that's the picture you see on the far left. Um, mushroom paper, that's just something that I made by blending polypores together and putting them through a, a sieve, essentially. But tried to get some pictures of mica materials. I don't have a whole lot. Um, the product we just launched and sold out almost immediately was a Pinellas Stypticus jar. So I was working with my team to scale and optimize the luciferin luciferase reaction in Pinellas stypticus to give you a beautiful jar of glowing fungus that you can keep by your bedside. I brought some bags home and Alex was like, 
it's it looks like a computer screen is on yeah um, I, the first night i woke up in the middle of the night and i rolled over in kind of like a half dream state and i literally thought there was like an open computer screen on our on, on our uh 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 bench and i was like it, it took me a while to kind of wake up enough to remember that that was this glowing bag of fungus and Lyra's actually been able to fruit these mushrooms as well, which is pretty hard to do. Um, only a few people in the world, right? Have I mean, actually grown it. It's, it's hard. I found, I have a whole Google docs of like instances where people have fruited Pinellas Dipticus. And there's a few documented on Mycotopia, the Shroomery, Facebook. Um, there's one guy in Finland who's making like the most beautiful flushes I've ever seen. So I messaged him. He gave me a culture. We'll see if I can be as good as him. And yeah, it's fun. But, you know, this is a, another fungal product that the Odin is offering. Um, so Ryan, yeah, the Netflix series about the guy in Mississippi, that's um, this guy and the picture to the left, his name's David Ishi, and he is a dog breeder and has been working with some gene editing to weave into his dog breeding. And he's brilliant. I'm going to like David Ishi school every day. I'm like, so David, tell me about ITS primers or something else super nerdy and we'll talk for like ever. And it's amazing. And that series is called Unnatural Selection. It's on Netflix. There's also a few good YouTube videos. He has a YouTube channel, David Ishi. And you can um, get a lot of really fun experiments through him. He has one where he grows bioluminescent bacteria in a jack-o'-lantern. Um, it's a little after Halloween, but you know, why it's not? It's always Halloween. It's always <laughs> Halloween, sure. And we saw a lot of other kits. You can discover natural, your own, you can find your own antibiotics at home. I really like that one. There's a microbe mosaic where you can paint with bacteria that grow in a certain color and a lot of other fun, very accessible, very approachable science kits. They make a great gift um, if you're interested in, I mean, the whole reason I was introduced to the Odin was because I wanted to develop my skills as a mycologist and be more molecular and intentional and deliberate with breeding fungi. I found the Odin, I bought some kits from them and Found out they're moving to Austin. So now I'm part of the team, but um, he's one of the, yeah, he is trying to produce a glow in the dark dog. Yep. We're not doing that with our dog. <laughs> <laughs> She's too old now. You have to get it at the embryonic phase. Uh, some other things we're working on, Kaidozan. So Kaidozan comes from chitin. It's deacetylated chitin. And that's in the cell walls of fungus. This material is fantastic. It is, you just just research Kaidazan, you'll see the many applications it has, the incredible sustainability that it has to offer too. Most Kaidazan materials come from a byproduct of seafood, so shrimp shells and any other shellfish type skeleton, uh, exoskeleton, gets ground up and deacetylated. You add some vinegar or whatever solvent, depending on the specific type of Kaidazan, and you can grow these little films. And it's wonderful. I've worked with this a few times and I just found a supplier that makes it from fungus. They make it from aspergillus and oyster mushrooms. And right now I just know of a producer in China, but I would love to see it show up in other parts of the world. Anyway, it's just another practical application that fungi could potentially offer us. Um, here is a picture of a mushroom leather grow kit that we're working on. It's still in the remedial phases for sure. Um, this is no easy task to make a kit where people can grow mushroom leather at home without um, some kind of expensive equipment. And of course, there's a lot of trade secrets that I'm trying to work out. But yes, hopefully that'll be launched Q1 of 2022, we'll see. Um, yeah, if you wanna keep following more mushroom department related things, mycology related things from the Odin, 
follow the Odin. We have an Instagram, the Odin Inc. And then we created another one called Mycota Labs. That's a branch specifically for any novel fungal application. And there's there's so much, there's, there's a lot of interesting things going on. So I think this is the last slide.